I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Michelle Amazine. I'm the Director of the Communication Research Center here at the College of Communication. And I'd like to in uh, introduce our DeFleur Distinguished Lecturer for the Fall 2021 semester, Dr. Deb Roy. He is a professor of Media Arts and Sciences at MIT, and he directs the MIT Center for Constructive Communication. He's also a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He leads research in applied machine learning and human-machine interaction with applications in designing systems for learning and constructive dialogue and for mapping and analyzing large-scale media ecosystems. He's also co-founder of the and, and chair of Portico, a nonprofit social technology company that develops and operates the Local Voices Network to surface underheard voices and bridge divides, which he'll be talking about today. Uh, he's an advocate for the design and use of technology for social good. Dr. Roy has served on the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, and he currently serves on the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder, and wasn't there a report just released this week? Yes. So he's a native of Canada. He received his Bachelor's of Applied Science from the University of Waterloo and his PhD in Media Arts and Sciences from MIT. Today he's going to be talking to us about bringing people and technology together in a new kind of social network. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deb Roy. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I can take my mask off. I'm 12 feet away from you, I hope. Um, um, it's really an honor to, to be here and, and uh, be invited to talk about this work and also be in person with human beings in a, in a room. What a, what a great feeling. Um, so I really am excited to tell you about the Local Voices Network. Um, and let me just uh, begin by talking a little bit about the framing for this uh, center at MIT and Cortico, uh, the kind of problem that is motivating work across many different efforts, including the one I'll focus on today, um, is one of social fragmentation. Um, and its correlates the sense of uh, decay and trust, which is being uh, observed and measured in, in various different ways, um, a decay in uh, a sense of truth or a uh, shared sense of truth, um, which affects us all. I thought I'd uh, just pull this piece of data to show how uh, it affects us uh, right here in Boston. This is from the Atlantic two years ago. Nationwide, if we disregard the smallest counties, the most politically intolerant county in America appears to be Suffolk County, <laughs> Massachusetts, which includes the city of Boston. So here we are uh, in the middle of this. Uh, this is based on um, a, a measure called affective polarization, where people are asked about their, their attitude towards others uh, across party lines. Um, and uh, this, this county does not score well um, on that. Um, another interesting, I actually pulled a piece of data, this is from a <coughs> recent um, study, another um, metric for sort of measuring and tracking this kind of seg uh, fragmentation is a false polarization. This is, uh, I think, a really important measure of how we tend to um, misunderstand others uh, across the divide. So uh, here are two data points um, from a recent a study of these were rep a representative group of self uh, reporting uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, across the US. Um, when Republicans were asked what fraction of Democrats are LGBT, uh, the estimate from the representative group was 38%, where the actual measured self report number is 6%. Um, when Democrats were asked what fraction of Republicans earn greater than $250,000 a year, Democrats thought 44% of Republicans clear that salary bar. In reality, 2%. Um, and we track over time the gap between actual and perceived, the gaps are growing. So there really are, in, in various ways, um, an acceleration of uh, what I think a lot of people agree are alarming characteristics of this kind of um, uh, growing divide, which 
um, creates conditions for hate, dehumanization, slippery slope uh, to violence, as we, um, uh, of course, all witnessed it with the storming of the Capitol. Um, there's a lot of different factors. It's an incredibly complex space. Our particular path into this, uh, um, sort of thinking about social fragmentation and thinking about ways to study and address it, uh, uh, come through the lens of our work in social media networks. Um, and um, I just wanted to give you a quick sketch of work going back to 2015, um, which led to uh, the, the Local Voices Network, um, which I'll focus on for, for most of my presentation. Um, so this is just a sketch, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but work that we were, uh, our lab was engaged in at MIT on tracking the ebb and flow of tweets about the presidential election, where, where we were automatically classifying tweets uh, from millions of users on Twitter uh, into different topics related to the presidential election, and sort of understanding the uh, just the ebb and flow of kind of share of attention. Uh, we partnered with the Washington Post to actually create a kind of complement, complementary window into how people were uh, engaging with the issues. Uh, complementary to surveys and, and polls. Um, and we also uh, had the honor of um, collaborating with the Commission for Presidential Debates, where we were able to take some of the Twitter data we were analyzing um, and identify topics that seemed to be of particular salience um, uh, during the debates and uh, take the topics and find representative tweets translate those into recommended questions for the moderators of the presidential debates. Um, and we actually were able to uh, have a couple of the questions that were put to candidates Trump and Clinton uh, based on this analysis. So this was an, a kind of example of using some of the machine learning technology to go from uh, uh, sort of listening to uh, Twitter as a, as a signal and trying to have some way to kind of weave it into an important um, part of the agenda setting for the election. Um, by the eve of the election, uh, we decided we would pull the social network data of the people who were tweeting about the issues. We tried our best to remove the bots from the data. And we ended up with this graph. And you can see here that there's uh, these are each node represents a user on Twitter. Um, and they're uh, color-coded by who um, the users are following of the, the various candidates. Um, what you see really prominently in this diagram, which surprised us, was how tightly interconnected um, followers of candidate Trump, this is a snapshot taken in the fall uh, about a month before the election, um, and how disconnected that group of users are from the rest of the users on Twitter that were tweeting about election-related issues. We were also analyzing uh, media coverage uh, at a national level across um, a wide range, politically wide ranging set of um, news outlets. And so we built a database of journalists who were talking, who were writing stories about the election. And we identified thousands of journalists' personal Twitter accounts. Um, and we located them in this graph. So when you light up the location of several thousand journalists, um, what you're seeing. Um, in blue and in yellow, um, and let's see, there they are pulsating. Um, blue are verified on Twitter, yellow are unverified journalists. Um, the general pattern is pretty clear, in fact, stunningly clear, that uh, media professionals themselves were trapped on one side of this fragmented divide, uh, along with, uh, by the way, myself, somewhere in the middle of this, uh, uh, this um, uh, configuration. So when I started showing this visualization to some of my colleagues uh, at MIT and uh, elsewhere in town, um, I got a lot of questions about the Trump tribe um, and a lot of assumptions about what was going on with this group, which I do not belong to. Um, and I had trouble, actually, in looking into the Twitter data and saying very much of anything beyond there's a lot of shouting, a lot of extreme positions throughout uh, the Twitter scape. Um, and so this uh, experience and sort of seeing this data and this picture, which became kind of iconic for us in our group, uh, what we, kind of one view of what we meant by fragmentation, um, 
took us eventually in uh, 2017 out of um, out of Boston. I had the um, the good fortune of having a, a friend and colleague named Matt Dunn, um, who used to run AmeriCorps Vista and was also a, a state senator in Vermont, and had a a, a great network of uh, connections throughout the country, in, in, including that we used some data to select towns that were politically diverse and small, uh, that were um, uh, that had played a pretty prominent role, sort of in in, uh, in the election in terms of rural urban uh, uh, breakout. And we went on a field trip. Um, so I should take this picture, so I'm not in the photo. Um, and we gathered. Uh, uh, groups. We, we, uh, Matt was able to uh, bring uh, uh, community leaders from these small towns. So this is uh, Anamosa, Iowa. We also went to Newton in Iowa, Platteville, uh, Wisconsin, Springfield, Vermont. And in, in each of these uh, towns, we were able to spend a couple of hours with a group of community leaders, so heads of uh, uh, local businesses, and schools, and hospitals. Um, and we asked just in general about uh, hopes and concerns about life in their community, um, and then the role of media and social media, and any anything they felt was changing, you know, over over the, the years. Um, and one of the things that um, surprised me most, and at the time I was actually actively serving as chief media scientist at Twitter, and very active in seeing the praises of social media, um, at which, by the way, I I, I could uh, still do on on request right now. There's a lot of positive things about social media, but uh, I, I heard something actually multiple times across uh, these uh, conversations. Something along the lines of, now that I know what my neighbor really thinks, because I saw what they said on Facebook, I no longer try to talk to them. Um, and to me, this was one of the uh, most disturbing things um, I heard, and I heard it more than once, that uh, not only were faults or misunderstandings being created through, um, uh, through social media, but they were actually blocking communications that otherwise would naturally happen uh, in these small uh, communities. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, an excellent book um, and, a, and a set of studies by a computational social scientist named Christopher Bale, um, and he used the phrase, uh, sort of the notion of a, uh, prism that social media is creating this distorting, systematically distorted view of others. Um, and it seems like we have direct access because those really are real human beings, including our own neighbors. Um, but the behaviors they select for um, that and, and the people who tend to feel comfortable expressing themselves, um, their systematic uh, sorting of behavior that is leading to this kind of distorted view, which I would just summarize in a non-scientific way with some of the, the kind of characteristics that we, we seem to feel over and over. There's a lot of uh, shouting, people taking extreme points of view that are reactive, that are disconnected often from everyday life, that lead to a kind of divisive um, uh, dynamic. And the underlying model of all of the major social media platforms. Uh, if, you, if you think of LinkedIn as a social media platform, hundreds of millions of people connected digitally, let's set LinkedIn aside. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Um, in each of these cases, there's an underlying model that promotes a certain kind of behavior which selects for a lot of that. And so our interest was in actually uh, leveraging some of the same technologies that underlie uh, the, the power and the advances of social media networks, um, but actually deliberately try to design for um, optimizing for listening, where nuanced, reflective conversations grounded in our everyday lives, and that had a more connective kind of dynamic could flourish. So that was the goal. Um, and so the way it summarized this is, by the way, if you ever, uh, do you, for those of you who remember the early days of uh, uh, MySpace and then Facebook and Twitter in the early days, we used to call these social networks. Do you remember that? And then, did you notice at some point we started calling them social media? Um, you ever stop to wonder why you stopped calling them social networks and started calling them social media? Um, it was really the 
business model of an ad-supported platform that drove a change in the optimization of the design of these platforms to keep people on for as long as possible and switch from a network where at some point your own social network would r run dry. There'd, there'd be nothing more interesting to deliver. Uh, but you could always, if you're running a large enough platform, mine content from elsewhere and create a media experience. And so that shift from a social network to social media uh, happened, um, you know, as, as each, in particular with Facebook and Twitter, as they started to scale um, and optimize for that kind of uh, capability. Um, I use purposefully the phrase social media network because the, the social network never went away. And the, uh, the social media prism is in particular powerful because those are other individuals. Um, but the prism is optimizing for a media function where to, to be an effective user uh, and sort of uh, succeed or be successful on all of these platforms uh, is equated with building an audience. And the bigger the audience, the better in terms of how the platforms are designed. But when you think about it, the bigger your audience becomes, the less connected connection you could possibly have with any individual in that audience. This would be a very different dynamic if there are only five of you who are sitting around a table. Instead, you're sort of spread out, and you're, you kind of have become an audience-like substance, right? When I look out, not quite. I can even make out uh, faces behind masks at, at the back of the room. But on, on these platforms, the bigger, the more disconnected. So, what if we could bring in small, uh, live, co-present dialogue um, and all of the social uh, habits and customs that we have in how we behave when we're in, in small groups um, and create a new category that actually leverage some of the power and scale of digital networks? That's the concept that we are interested in. Uh, I don't think we've built a, a a fully functioning social dialogue network, but it's a concept that is motivating a, a, a number of different efforts, um, a couple of which I want to highlight for the remainder of my talk. So let me tell you a little bit about who's behind this. Uh, first of all, the organizations. There is the center. This was just launched earlier this year at MIT. Um, and I'll show you some of the people in each of these orgs in a second. Uh, Cortico is a nonprofit. Um, and the reason there are two organizations, not one, is the research center at MIT is responsible for uh, basic and exploratory research, and also in collaboration with Cortico, the development of advanced prototypes that are uh, robust enough that we can put them into the field with field partners and do extended uh, pilots, experiments, where we co-design and work with groups outside of MIT. And that requires uh, a relatively serious amount of software engineering and support. Um, when we have pilots that are successful, uh, our interest is in then seamlessly moving them into deployment where if there is interest in more use of that particular prototype, there's actually a professional uh, team, software engineering team, and uh, program and partner support team in the nonprofit. And uh, MIT and Cortico entered into a unique cooperation agreement uh, three years ago to enable this kind of uh, cooperation between the two. Um, so the people of the center, uh, so the first time we got together uh, in person without masks outdoors uh, just a month ago on the Cape. Um, and those are, I'm not going to read all the names, but uh, I am uh, here to represent the work of uh, all the people represented here, including some advisors who are not uh, pictured but have been uh, working uh, closely with our team. Um, this is the, uh, the team at Cortico. Uh, I should have said I, I both direct the center and I'm currently um, CEO of the nonprofit and a co-founder along with two others. Um, and these are the generous individuals, um, foundations, um, and uh, uh, corporations that su have supported the work that uh, I'll be presenting today. Um, and so that brings me to the, the effort, the Local Voices Network, where the overall goal is to surface underheard voices and perspectives for listening, learning, and constructive action. Um, the key idea behind Local Voices Network, or LVN, uh, as I'll, I'll uh, refer to it in short form, is to combine, on one hand, the ancient social technologies or skills and ideas and methods of facilitated dialogue and community organizing, 
and bring those together with a set of modern digital technologies designed to scaffold and scale, and in particular, create connected dialogue, and to enable surfacing of connections across dialogue, which in traditional facilitated dialogue, uh, what happens in the room stays in the room, and if you want to take something out, at, at best you have some post-its or uh, notes, but instead if we can have uh, the power of speech and language analytics, there's a whole set of new possibilities, and that's what we're trying to, to bring together. So we've been doing work with facilitated dialogue experts, including some in our team now, to develop and iterate uh, the format, a kind of recipe for structured conversations. Uh, we've been developing hardware. Um, if any of you are interested, I have one of our digital hearts here you can come take a look after. This is a device that will, uh, you just slip out a case, battery operated, um, one button to turn on is a tablet for the facilitator, and it will both record high quality audio. We're using a, a, a microphone array from groups that can sit around the heart work on a digital heart, or you can play back audio excerpts where you can bring voices from other conversations that have happened in the past uh, into a new conversation. It creates a kind of uh, link. You know, I'll show you the effect of that um, in, a, in an example in a, in a minute. So we run training programs for experienced facilitators uh, in two hours to orient them to the format of the, the conversation, depends on the use, and I'll show you a couple of use cases uh, uh, in, in a minute. Um, and then a key idea is that the facilitators invite people from their networks, their trusted networks, into small group conversations. So you may be familiar with a growing number of these kind of living room projects, uh, conversation projects, bringing people from across divides into a room together. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is actually uh, we tend to have groups that are from the same enclave uh, who actually sometimes know one another or have similar perspectives who will come together in trusted small groups where they feel actually, they tend to feel quite comfortable talking to one another, but they know that they're going on record. And that conversation or part of that conversation can be shared either for uh, sense making or actually to be heard by other groups. Um, the conversations which were happening around the hearth, this is one of our early conversations in Madison, Wisconsin, where we, we began this work. Um, uh, and with the pandemic, we uh, pivoted to Zoom, and now we have a mix of both in-person and, uh, and virtual conversations. Um, and the three properties that uh, permeate all of the, the conversations um, are, uh, they tend to be spaces with uh, a lot of nuance um, where people expect to listen to others but also be heard. Um, we have always focused on this idea of participant driven agenda. So these are not focus groups or interviews where someone comes in with a, a very clear agenda of what they want to talk about, but instead they set a general uh, um, uh, conversation into motion and then allow the participants to actually uh, shape and drive the conversation. Um, and third, the principle of experience over opinion, especially when you get into hot or contested topics, the facilitator is constantly asking people to uh, shift from uh, expressing their opinion to sharing a personal experience they've had that relates to that topic or that opinion. Um, and so I'm going to now play for you a two minute video that just puts these pieces together so you can see how the technology. Uh, I show you the hearth briefly, but more important actually than the hardware is the software that allows for the capture and transcription and analysis from analytic listening. Um, so I'll play this two minute video and then take you into some case studies. Cortica partners hold conversations with their community members either virtually over Zoom or in person around the digital hearth. Conversation recordings are uploaded, transcribed, and stored in an LVN collection. Here you can see the number of conversations and the number of community voices within a collection. You can use the search bar to find specific words or themes, use the interactive map to see where the conversations are happening, and explore highlights other users have created. 
Use the Insights tool to understand what people are talking about across an entire collection. Click any topic to view the complete list of keywords and explore excerpts containing those keywords. You can dive deeper into a specific conversation and see who participated, how often they spoke, or click on a speaker bar to listen to their voice. Hover over keywords to visualize where in the conversation they're surfaced and click to listen. Invite conversation participants, journalists, and other stakeholders to join and listen on the platform. Collaboratively amplify key moments from the conversations by turning them into highlights, which can be tagged, downloaded, shared, and embedded across the web. From the platform, partners have shared highlights with a broader audience by dividing them by theme in project reports or embedding them in digital reporting. Highlights have also been shared in physical space, like on a neighborhood walking tour, for example. Partners can even create powerful narratives to support advocacy work, like in this example, that uses specific highlights to share a broader collection narrative and then invites local artists to visually uplift participants' voices. Learn more about our work by visiting us at cortico.ai. So what I want to do now is highlight a particular use case which we have gotten quite excited about. So we've had, we've done about 60 projects with different community organizations around the country, covering uh, around 30 states. Um, we've had about between six and 7,000 people participate in you know, these recorded dialogues for a variety of different um, uh, kind of exploratory use cases. Um, so one category that we have become excited about is responsive decision making, where the idea is to take small group conversations uh, in this kind of in, in this sort of authentic uh, mode where people are actually talking uh, with one another um, and create a connection with some kind of decision making process and I'm going to show you in particular uh, some very important decisions that impact people's lives at the level of the city um, in the hiring of a police chief and the election of a mayor in fact our mayor in Boston um, and the idea is to have a bottom-up sense-making process, so patterns from these conversations can actually uh, make contact in some way with the decision-making process, um, and ideally to have top-down transparency so that both the people who engage in these uh, conversations, but the larger public actually has evidence that people are being heard, including people who typically would not show up on Twitter or call into talk radio or go to town hall, which tends to be a performative space uh, to be heard, but actually make space for, for the introverts and people who would uh, perhaps not be comfortable to be heard, and in the process, increase the perceived legitimacy of whatever decision-making process um, is at play. So this is, for us, uh, one very, uh, we think, um, kind of high potential kind of use case. So I'm going to show you two examples. The first happened kind of uh, accidentally. Uh, we were piloting a, a very key person in this work is Professor uh, Catherine Kramer. She's a um, uh, professor of political science at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, um, and has been very instrumental in shaping LBN. And we actually um, piloted in Madison, Wisconsin, which is her hometown, starting in early 2019. Um, and we had started uh, gathering small groups through uh, community partners around the city, focusing on uh, communities in low-income neighborhoods, a lot of uh, black and Latino um, uh, 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 um, members of communities were part of these conversations. And we were having general conversations about hopes and concerns about life uh, and living in Madison. Um, and, uh, in the midst of all of this, there was a, a sudden departure of the police chief um, in Madison. Uh, there was actually a young black man that was shot and killed by a white police officer. The police chief did not handle the situation well. There was increasing political pressure, and very suddenly, on a Sunday night, um, he uh, posted a, a blog post that said, I'm not coming in uh, Monday morning. And the city was uh, left uh, without a police chief. PFC stands for the Police and Fire Commission of Madison, a five-person commission who's responsible for hiring the police chief. So they announced that they a plan for a community engagement uh, 
uh, process, uh, given the circumstances, they wanted to have a, a new kind of search. Um, and so they partnered with us. Um, we had already, this, is, this depicts kind of an iconic form, a single conversation. We already had a collection of conversations. So we um, seized the opportunity to take this data, the kind of recordings of several hundred people talking about uh, hopes and concerns in general, and we tagged the subset of uh, these recordings where people were talking in particular about public safety and policing. Um, and then we upweighted the subset where people were actually sharing their own first-hand experience uh, that they've had in Madison. Um, and we took these, uh, um, each of these being a, a piece of speech, and then grouped them uh, based on themes. So what I'm going to do now um, is play for you about two minutes. So you can just get a sense. You'll, you'll hear uh, small snippets of audio from different conversations, and you'll see the labels that our uh, sense-making team applied to them, and they'll just give you a sense of some of the texture of the conversations that we're able to um, gather. And then I'll show you how uh, these, the, the voices and the analysis play a role in the actual uh, selection of the police chief. It's hard to get away from how powerful, you know, the institution and the badge and having a gun is and how much that emboldens individuals. Uh, well, I mean, growing up, one of, one of the first <laughs> values and principles that I was taught was to never trust the police in any situation or circumstance. Uh, and then that was kind of proven to me around age 12 or 13 when I saw a family member be shot in the back eight times. Este, eh, yo todavía tengo pavor, eh, el pavor que tenía cuando no tenía la, la licencia, este, que cada vez que veo si eran como unos 10, 10 patrullas ahí, este, eh, a ver a, a quién iban, iban a agarrar.
And that's actually Jackie Bojess, one of the members of the five-person uh, committee. Um, and actually, Sean Burns um, was the, uh, the person who was ultimately hired and sworn in last year. Um, so to summarize what uh, we're able to do here um, is uh, enter into the actual public forum uh, in, in a very visible way where the questions that were being put to the candidates um, were grounded in community voice um, in a way that, and some of the feedback we got from the PFC was that people, there were kind of what they called the usual candidates that would show up at the town halls, and they had two town hall hearings to get input for the police search. Um, but they heard from very different members of the community through this process, people who would, for various reasons, not show up at the town hall, but who would go to one of these smaller group conversations. So it kind of created a decentralized extension of, of the town hall process. And because the, the, the record, there's a, a durable record of voice, it creates a more accountable uh, process. That was the feedback. What was missing in this feedback uh, in, in the process was uh, public awareness of what had actually happened. So the kind of transparency and awareness that could actually create uh, uh, a kind of greater uh, impact um, was missing. This was all sort of done behind the scenes, not because we were trying to hide anything, we, we just were working directly with the PFC. Um, and so with, with the um, uh, lessons learned from Madison, we had an opportunity uh, with uh, the local elections that just um, transpired in Boston. Um, so I'm going to now show you a 90 second explainer video that we used to launch a conversation campaign in August. So just three months ago right here in Boston. And I'll show you a little bit of uh, what, what uh, came out of that effort. And this was, uh, you'll, you'll see the explainer video. What it's describing is a program that runs on top of the LDN platform. After a historic year, the local elections in November have the potential to produce historic change, but all too often the conversation is dominated by opinion polls of likely voters, as well as sensational stories on social media that distract from real problems. The truth is, underserved communities with critical perspectives on the issues are often underheard in civic spaces. Real Talk for Change wants to amplify these voices by turning conversations into real impact. Here's how it works. A team of trusted community leaders will host small group conversations in priority neighborhoods across the city. You'll share your hopes, concerns, and experiences of living in Boston with the option to state your name or keep it anonymous. These conversations are recorded, transcribed, and entered into our online platform. Our team will use online analysis tools to sort through these conversations, pull out patterns, themes, and insights, and summarize the findings on a public dashboard. We're inviting candidates for mayor and city council to use the dashboard to better understand the lived experience and perspectives of folks in Boston. We'll also use the dashboard to recommend questions to the media for public debates and interviews with candidates. And it's all public, so you can watch your voice influence decision makers more directly than ever before and learn from one another through cross-community listening. Together, we can constructively shape the 2021 Boston election cycle and build a better, more equitable city. Join a conversation, share your experience, inspire a better Boston. So we partnered with a, a group of community partners, several more joined after this video was made beyond the ones that are listed. Um, and together, uh, they were able to organize conversations over the course of the next two months, so this is into October, over 300 people from 21 of the 23 neighborhoods in Boston uh, joined uh, conversations um, that fed into than the sense making process. So I'm, I'm going to show you another now, just a one minute video that just unpacks a little bit more of how the actual pattern analysis works from these conversations. Through LVN.org, we land on the RTFC conversation collection page that gives us an overview of all the conversations in the collection. The conversations tab allows us to see all conversations that have been hosted, uploaded, and transcribed. We can deep dive into each conversation and see who participated, when they spoke, and keywords that emerged throughout the conversation. We can explore the full transcript and listen to the voices of participants. 
Yes, um, my question for the future of Boston and hockey. Key moments from the conversation are uplifted and highlighted. We pull all the highlighted moments into the sense making tool Insight. With Insight, we assign thematic codes to all highlights. We create tags with a hierarchical structure and color codes. We can listen to the tagged highlights to confirm our coding process, and tagged highlights can be filtered by conversation, by participants, or by specific tags. Once we have listened to, highlighted, and coded all conversations, we pull out themes and patterns that emerge from the conversations. Once we assign topics, we begin to cluster by similarity and themes emerge, such as housing, growth, and inequality. We actually created a new tool that's shown here where you can actually interactively explore all the conversations in a collection. So this is the 300 plus voices. Uh, you can see which parts of each conversation uh, different uh, thema thematic tags were applied and also explore the intersections showing here, for example, a large number of intersections between housing and discrimination. Um, so we then uh, took this data on that dashboard and made it available to um, the Boston Globe. Uh, Megan Irons, who is one of the journalists at the Globe, uh, then hosted um, a series of two public forums uh, with the two final mayoral candidates, and this was broadcast uh, on a local television network. So I'm just going to show 75 seconds, I think, roughly, of uh, that, uh, that program, just to give you a sense of how the data ends up in, in the... Let's uh, move now to our next theme, economic opportunity. And we're going to hear from Kenyatta from Roxbury. I was a single mom. And because I couldn't afford an education, I couldn't get those high paying jobs. You know, if I got the experience, years of experience, but I don't have the education, when does that gonna come again? We've been stuck in some ways as a society with this idea that to be considered ready to step into these roles, you need to have an education. To get an education, you have to take on all this debt. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of city jobs open at any given moment, any day, right? Maybe. Uh, let's move on now to education. I graduated two years ago from a Boston Public High School, and I felt that my high school didn't receive as much funding compared to like other high schools in the Boston area. How can we like make it equal playing field? You know, like to ensure that like everyone gets like a, a good high school experience. We've got so much work to do as a district to make sure that Alejandro, his classmates, and every student that is a part of the Boston Public Schools has a high quality experience. And that's around making sure that the funding is in the right places. So uh, along with the, um, the engagement, and this was really, again, a, a kind of an example of very publicly shaping the agenda, right, for one of, one of many events during the election cycle. Uh, the Globe wrote, uh, actually, uh, uh, a couple of pieces about the effort along the way. Um, this one is actually about the public portal, which we also designed um, uh, as, uh, by the way, that was Caesar McDowell, uh, Associate Director of the Center, and who led this, uh, the real talk ever. About the things that are happening in our area, they just kind of happen, and then we have to deal with them. Um, and so, that so the Globe was actually able to embed some of the voices from these collections into the stories, and they also pointed to this online portal, which we designed uh, over the last few months to actually create that transparent window where uh, actually, if any of you are interested, you go to realtalkforchange.org um, and you have this uh, very easy to use interface where you can go by neighborhood, by theme, and actually listen to uh, the entire collection that uh, arose. So this is kind of closing the loop then on this uh, top-down transparency. So we actually think um, this model has a lot of promise. In fact, we're wondering, well, why can't every city have something like this? So there's a kind of sense of a, a piece of civic infrastructure, which is one part technology, but it's very important uh, to have the capacity building for community organizations and the interface with the right uh, uh, parts of the city for all of this to work. I actually had some more content, but I realize it's, it's quarter to five, so I think I might just try to wrap it up so there's some time for conversation. Um, I will, uh, here's what I was going to cover. I'll just give you the, the, uh, the abridged version. Um, there, there's another 
opportunity here, which we've been very interested in from the beginning, which is separate from connecting members of communities to power structures, is to actually work on bridging divides across groups. Um, and so there is a, um, a, a notion of what we call cross-pollination, where I mentioned this hearth can actually play segments from one conversation into another. So uh, um, I was, what I was going to do is play for you an example of an exchange. We've been doing these experiments in cross-pollination between very different groups. Um, and uh, with the right setup, can lead to very rich exchanges um, of uh, uh, perspective. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that actually uh, uh, hearing personal experiences rather than facts actually is a better path to building mutual respect. So the question is, how do we avoid echo chambers? And actually, if people are not interested in hearing from one another, um, how do you force that? Um, Diana Mutz has done some of the definitive work on where cross-cutting exposure actually happens it's in the workplace. Um, and we actually have a, a very interesting opportunity. The MIT administration has decided and invited our center to actually deploy a version of LVM inside the MIT community. So starting in January, uh, students, staff, and faculty are going to start organizing small recorded conversations. Uh, I don't know how things are here at BU, but we're having some issues in having real conversations. We just had a canceled professor lecture that's been in the news. Uh, we are drafting a new value statement for the university. Uh, a lot of this social fragmentation um, you know, it, it has washed into the MIT community of 25,000 people. So we're going to be doing a, an experiment there. Um, and this is just a picture of the data trust and how we're thinking about displaying uh, data. The final thing I'll just mention is Everything I've told you today, a problem with how this really scales is there's a lot of friction because we need organizations to actually gather groups. And then there's a kind of sense-making apparatus that's pretty heavy. Um, and we're asking often strangers to come together for 60 to 90 minutes. These are long conversations, big, big commitment. Um, the, the quality of the conversations are incredible, um, but getting people to show up in the first place um, is difficult, in particular for a young, younger generation, like younger than everyone in this room. So we've been spending a lot of time with uh, high schoolers and uh, uh, teenagers, um, and we are um, uh, we have a, a team that has been at work designing um, a mobile first social dialogue network, uh, a kind of third space uh, where you have in real life, you have a social media space to have an end to end. Um, kind of uh, um, network, um, and I'm just going to give you a little uh, behind the curtain um, sneak peek. Uh, it is codenamed um, Blink, and there will be a way to have virtual live uh, dialogue, including uh, someone playing the role of facilitator, the ability to blink in and blink out piece of conversation, just as you can cross-pollinate with the hearth. Um, and we are planning to start piling this with um, uh, 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 sort of high school age groups uh, next year. Um, so I'm going to uh, end by playing one final clip for you. Uh, you know, if there's kind of a guiding um, principle behind all, what motivates all our work, it is that seeing and hearing the humanity in others is necessary for de democracy to function. Um, and the problem with so much of our mediated environment is that it distracts others and puts them into caricatured buckets and allows us to carry those caricatures into real life. And, and it's incredibly destructive. Um, and you know, our goal is to really take some of the ideas that I've, I've shared with you and find ways to scale and connect communities that are interested in these kinds of um, uh, these these kinds of connected dialogues. What I'm going to play for you just to end, we have a semantic search capability that we're just experimenting with using deep learning uh, on the uh, transcripts. We did a, a search um, for how people express their own identity, uh, which of course is uh, uh, so so important and. So often, 
the, the sort of target of caricature, to, to just hear, this is a sampling from a few of the thousands of people that have now participated across our, our effort, in their own words, how they talk about their identity. So I'll just let that play, and that will be my last slide. I am most definitely a city girl. I'm a third generation farmer. I'm an associate pastor of uh, New Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. I'm a combat veteran. I, I served overseas in Korea and in the Army. My family and I came here um, as refugees from Vietnam. I'm a white man living in the U.S. that's been educated. I am a Muslim um, and a person of color. When I was growing up, I grew up in a family that identified as very Irish. And I remember being asked to be Puerto Rican or black or white. And I just didn't even know how to answer that question. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I am. Uh, where I grew up was um, everybody around me was black, but I didn't realize until I got up here in Birmingham that we were all also the same kind of black, like socioeconomically, so we were all very similar. And then I got up here and realized, oh, everybody don't act like this. Um, and not only did everybody else not act like this, I was somehow like an outlier. My parents are both immigrants to the U.S. and they came from uh, Eritrea, which is this country in East Africa. When I was about 10 years old, my grandparents came to the U.S. and lived with us. And that whole experience gave me a lot of time to like talk and listen to my grandparents' experiences. And it was really important to me because it gave me a way to think about like who I am, especially because the schools I went to, I was oftentimes like an outcast because like I was usually the only kid who was the child of immigrants and having to like know it like oh I'm different from all these people somehow but like how am I also similar um so having those conversations and being able to I didn't like just sit back and listen um, mm -hmm. was really important to me and, and sort of shaped how I have thought about myself and my identity since then. Thank you so much for your attention. Sure, yeah, I think we have, we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions, if there are any, or, or comments. Yeah, I was curious um, of if the, uh, the software does uh, sentiment analysis as well. We saw a lot of topical dividing up of the data and where conversations went. Anything on sentiment, I think the degree of passion and emotion is also very interesting mm -hmm. to also yeah. understand. Is that in the works part of it, or just thoughts? Yes, um, it is. We we have uh, we have quite a bit of work on uh, uh, a lot of ideas and a little bit of work on quality of conversation and the sentiment and the, the kind of there's a lot of different aspects of um, how you can analyze the the manner of speech and so we've been doing things. Uh, so, first of all, in natural language processing, there's a kind of standard uh, um, approach to sentiment where you look for certain words and phrases, and now there's kind of deep learning models that generalize those to kind of classify. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't tried applying any of that to this data um, because it just, uh, yeah, it hasn't, hasn't felt like the relevant thing. Um, we've been, just to give you a sense of things that we have been uh, measuring um, turn-taking distribution, uh, the inner speaker pause, how long are their silences. Um, it's actually extraordinary when you work with um, experienced facilitators how they can hold space and just there can just be silence for you know long periods, which sometimes you need to actually you know, reflect and say something. Um, how often there are interruptions. Um, We've also, um, so these are all easy to measure once you have the kind of diarized speech. Um, we've been doing 